Okay. All right. So today it's on preserving renal function, which is what Grace is asking about. And um, people had requested that we present more on the ADA standards of care. And so I've incorporated that. So just to get you thinking, we have our question. Uh, diabetic kidney disease can be diagnosed based on one elevated urinary albumin creatinine ratio result. Progression can be slowed by appropriate treatment is most often associated with a rapid decline in EGFR, increases the risk of cardiovascular disease. One of those is right or both B and D is right. So just be thinking about that as we go through uh, the didactic. So uh, diabetic kidney disease is chronic kidney disease attributed to diabetes. It occurs in 20 to 40% of people with diabetes, but fewer than 10% of people are aware they have it, either because they've never been checked for it and it's developing under their noses until it gets so bad it can't be ignored, or we just don't explain it to them. In type 1 diabetes, it usually develops after they've had the diabetes for 10 years, but it can be present at diagnosis in type 2 diabetes, often because of the prodromal prediabetes, uh, mild diabetes, et cetera. Obviously, one of the consequences of diabetic kidney disease is that it can lead to kidney failure, requiring a renal replacement therapy. And in fact, it is the leading cause of end-stage kidney disease in the United States, with hypertension being the second leading cause. But even early stages of um, diabetic kidney disease can increase cardiovascular risk and healthcare cost. So we want to diagnose diabetic kidney disease early so we can stop the progression of the kidney disease, reduce the cardiovascular um, multimorbidity, and reduce the economic burden. Now, screening for it, the recommendations from the ADA standards of care are at least once a year, check a urine albumin, such as a urine albumin to creatinine ratio, and estimated GFR. Um, that should begin at or after five years in someone with type 1 diabetes, but at the time of diagnosis in someone with type 2 diabetes. Once the uh, urine albumin is over 300 milligrams per gram of creatinine, or the EGFR is between 30 and 60, these tests need to be monitored twice annually. As we go through the ADA um, standards of care, A is the highest level of evidence, B is the next higher, and C is supportive but un uncontrolled trials. So those are uh, B recommendations. Now, um, the standards of care say that screening for albuminuria can most easily be performed by a urinary albumin to creatinine ratio on a spot urine collection. Getting just a urine albumin increases the error rate, both negative and positive. And doing it for 24 hours only adds burden and doesn't add any accuracy. So that spot urine for a urine albumin to creatinine ratio is the best screening. In addition, um, it's considered normal if less than 30 and high if equal to or greater than 30. And first is the microalbuminuria and then over 300 would be the macro. But there's a lot of biologic variation. And so it's not considered elevated until two out of three specimens within three to six months show it's elevated. So if you have a normal one, you can consider it normal. But if you have an elevated urine micro, uh, urine albumin creatinine ratio, you should repeat it. And if the second one's elevated, then you can establish the diagnosis. If the second one's normal, then you need a third test to establish the diagnosis. Now, the urine albumin creatinine ratio can be elevated for reasons beyond kidney damage. And what I see a lot here in Colorado is exercise, especially you know, when I was taking care of adolescent males with diabetes and they were out doing snowboarding or mountain biking intensely before their appointment. Uh, infection, fever, congestive heart failure. 
if the blood sugar is real high around the time that the specimen's collected, if the blood pressure is high or they're menstruating, that can all cause false positives and needs to be repeated with them not exercising for 24 hours, which was really hard to get some of these kids to do when they don't have a bladder infection or something else uh, on that list. Um, an EGFR below 60 is considered abnormal, but we know that there's an age decline in EGFR. And right now there's this hot debate going back and forth between different parties. I don't know what you want to call them, different opinions. Some people think that in people that are older, uh, they shouldn't, it shouldn't be considered abnormal till it's below 45. And other people think it should still be 60. So I don't know where that's going to settle out. Regardless, as that EGFR gets below 60, even if it's age related, they may need to reduce the medications that are cleared by the kidney. So just be aware, under 60 for most people, who knows what it's going to say for a 70 year old in the future. Now, diabetic kidney disease is a clinical diagnosis. It's based on the presence of elevated albumin in the urine and or a reduced EGFR in the absence of other signs and symptoms of other causes of kidney damage. So the typical presentation of diabetic kidney disease is the person's had longstanding diabetes, but it can be present at diagnosis in type two patients. They have elevated urine albumin without hematuria, um, but some people have diabetic kidney disease without albuminuria. They only have a reduced EGFR, and we're seeing more and more of that in both type one and type two patients. Most often, they have retinopathy, but in people with type two diabetes, they can get nephropathy without retinopathy. So, but in most people with type one diabetes, if they have albuminuria and no retinopathy at all, you have to think about another condition. And then in diabetic kidney disease, the decline in GFR is very gradual. So suggestions that it might not be diabetic kidney disease, or they might have another kidney disease on top of diabetic kidney disease would be that they have red or white cells or cellular cast on the urine specimen, that the albuminuria is increasing very quickly, or they have full-blown nephrotic syndrome, that they have a very rapid decline in their EGFR, or as I mentioned, they have type 1 diabetes, they have kidney changes, but no eye changes. Then they should be referred to a nephrologist, and we'll talk more about this um, for further evaluation to see if it's something else. And believe me, I've seen patients who've had forms of glomerulonephritis, et cetera, on top of, or that was their main kidney disease, uh, diabetic kidney disease. At any GFR, the amount of albumin in the urine is associated with increasing risk of heart disease, progression of the kidney disease, and mortality. To monitor the patients, you need to, keep, you need to follow both albuminuria and GFR to help guide your treatment decisions. And to, like, as I mentioned, to be sure that you don't need to do renal dose adjustments for their medications. So the National Kidney Foundation Kidney Disease Outcomes Quality Initiative or KDOKI guidelines, you know, normal would be, um, a GFR over 90, but it's considered stage one if they have urine albumin, uh, and stage two if they have a fairly normal EGFR, but albuminuria. And then it goes into stage three. Stage four is 15 to 29 EGFR, and end stage is less than 15. And, and I gave you um, this chart to, to refer to so here they have normal EGFR and no albuminuria, but here they have normal EGFR and increasing albuminuria. Here they have no albumin, but reduced EGFR. And so there's every permutation on this chart and you can kind of see how the risk goes up. Now, what it doesn't mention is what if the uh, EGFR is well above 90 you know, what if they have hyperfiltration? What does that mean? Now, 
glomerular hyperfiltration can happen if the arterial leading into the glomerulus is dilated and a lot more blood and blood pressure is coming into this little glomerulus, it's going to push more fluid through and increase the filtration. Or if the outflow is blocked, it's going to put more pressure in the glomerulus and increase the filtration. In diabetes, both of these happen. And the high filtration itself can cause albuminuria and changes to the renal structure, the podocytes, et cetera. Um, so there can be physiologic causes for um, hyperfiltration, such as pregnancy and a high protein diet. Uh, but there's also a lot of diseases that can cause hyperfiltration. And we know that diabetes is one of those. And in fact, we recommend that people with diabetes don't have a high protein diet because it can worsen that glomerular uh, pressure by further dilating that afferent um, arterial. What we don't know is does hyperfiltration increase the risk of getting nephropathy? And this meta-analysis in 2009 said it's suggestive that it does. It appeared that those patients were 2.7 times more likely to progress to nephropathy. However, there were a lot of confounding variables that were not looked at. For instance, if the person was on a high protein diet and went back to a normal protein diet, was it the reduction in hyperfiltration or the reduction in protein exposure that protected their kidney? If they had really high blood sugar, that will cause hyperfiltration. If they brought their blood sugar down, was it bringing the blood sugar down or was it reducing the hyperfiltration? So they said that they needed to look at those confounding variables. A more recent study in 2017 confirmed that the evidence suggested that having hyperfiltration uh, was a sign that you were gonna have the onset and progression of diabetic kidney disease, but whether treating the hyperfiltration made a difference is not known. We know that there are medications that will help treat the hyperfiltration, including SGLT2 inhibitors by reducing that afferent uh, dilatation and uh, GLP-1 receptors, but nobody knows if that changes the progression or initiation of uh, kidney disease. What we do know is if a patient gets acute kidney injury, which is a 50% or greater drop in their EGFR or rise in their creatinine over a short period of time, we know that that is very bad at increasing the risk of progression of their uh, chronic kidney disease and leads to poor out health outcomes. Risk factors for having acute kidney injury is having diabetes, having pre-existing CKD, using medications that can cause kidney injury, especially if you have these two already existing. So that's why we tell our patients with diabetes to avoid non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. And while we're very careful in using iodine iodinated contrast agents, in addition, some of the medications uh, that alter renal blood flow and intrarenal hemodynamics can cause uh, an AKI. And that's diuretics, diuretics, diuretics. They're really bad in that regard, but ACE inhibitors and ARBs can also do it. And as I already mentioned, SGLT2 inhibitors were thought to do it, but now show that they protect against AKI. However, you don't want to confuse the beneficial small increase that you get in creatinine when you start an ACE inhibitor or an ARB with AKI. When you start an ACE or an ARB, that efferent uh, arterial relaxes. So the pressure in the glomerulus goes down, the filtration goes down, but that's protective. That's going to stop some of that albuminuria. That's going to stop some of that high pressure that's damaging the kidney structure. So as long as that rise in creatinine is less than 30% baseline, it's been shown to be a sign that that person is getting benefit and that long-term preservation that we're looking for from the ACEs and the ARBs. 
However, if the person already has reduced uh, intrarenal perfusion pressure, their glomerular pressure is already low because they're dehydrated or they have renal artery stenosis or they have congestive heart failure, you start that ACE or ARB and they're gonna go into a really high creatinine rise and that's where it needs to be cut down. Now, one of the things I wanna warn about for acute kidney injury is using a diuretic to treat the edema from a calcium channel blocker. The edema from calcium channel blocker is due to dil dilatation in the vessels. So it's a peripheral vessel dilatation, not a volume overload. So when you give those people diuretics for, for calcium channel blocker edema, you can actually put people in acute kidney injury. And my mother-in-law was put into uh, that because for that reason. Um, and so it, it's something that's very real to me, but when I go to all my internal medicine and diabetes conferences, it's something that they're constantly harping on. So I did wanna bring that to your attention. So the ACE inhibitors work by uh, relaxing the pressure here and SGLT2 inhibitors reduce the pressure here. And so they're complementary. Um, I will say that ACE and ARBs together are not, and I'll mention more on that in a minute. In addition to this benefit, um, SGLT2 inhibitors reduce fibrosis, oxidative stress, sympathetic tone, and are diuretic uh, sparing. And remember I said diuretics are one of the biggest causes of AKI. So if they can have that diuretic sparing effect, it's gonna benefit the kidneys. We need regular monitoring and surveillance to know when CKD is starting and to begin the treatment, to monitor the progression, to be sure that we catch any superimposed other kidney diseases, including the acute kidney um, impairment. And then to, we need to watch for, you know, Kidney disease can be caused by high blood pressure, but kidney disease can cause high blood pressure. Uh, when you have CKD, you retain more salt. So then you're gonna be prone to volume overload. You're gonna be prone to hyperkalemia, hypokalemia, hypocalcemia, hyperhospitemia, all that stuff. Metabolic acidosis, anemia tends to come on earlier in people with diabetic kidney disease than other kidney disease and metabolic bone disease and hyperparathyroidism does as well. You also need to monitor so you can keep adjusting the doses for renal dosing and determine when they need to see the nephrologist. Uh, this is just a, a chart that kind of helps guide you on that. So I'll leave that for your reference. Now back to the ADA standards of care, they say you wanna optimize glucose control to reduce the risk of initiating and to slow the progression of kidney disease. Uh, if the person has an EGFR over 30 and a urine albumin over 300, they should be started on an SGLT2 inhibitor. I will share that the new guidelines are 15 to 29, continue the SGLT2 inhibitor, and they just came out, the 2022 ones. Um, in patients who have a GFR uh, over 30 and urine albumin over 300, they should be put on an SGLT2 inhibitor also for cardiovascular risk reduction. And they also say to consider a GLP-1 receptor agonist for both renal and cardiovascular protection. Now, um, what is optimizing the glycemic control? Well, you wanna do, there's the glycemic effects of the medication. Intensive glucose control will help reduce the initiation and progression of kidney disease, but it can take a while, uh, about two to 10 years for this to have an impact. Once the person has chronic kidney disease, intensive control can increase their risk of hypoglycemia and sudden death. So protecting from it, but you have to be more careful once they have kidney disease. But you also then have the direct effects of some of the diabetes medications in protecting the kidney independent of the glucose level. And that's where the SGLT2 inhibitors and GLP-1 receptor agonists 
are showing additional benefit besides improving the blood sugar, they have other actions that protect the kidneys. However, the ADA still says that within the constraints of renal dosing, metformin should be considered first-line treatment in all patients with type 2 diabetes, including those with CKD. This is just a reminder of the FDA update to the uh, CKD dosing that occurred a few years ago. And the ADA guidelines point out that if your patient's going to have uh, an iodinated contrast imaging study, that the patients with an EGFR between 30 or 60 should have metformin temporarily discontinued until you're sure they come through that study and their EGFR doesn't drop further. I will say in my experience, radiology tells every patient on a metformin on metformin to stop it, and then the patients uh, don't, don't know when to resume it. Um, now the Kidoki, the renal guidelines say that the A1C should be determined somewhere between less than 6.5 to less than 8.0, depending on the patient's hypoglycemic risk. But if their EGFR is less than 30, the A1C is no longer reliable, and they recommend using CGM. And I just did an amazing webinar on this and the data on how unreliable the A1C is at an EGFR under 30 is amazing. Sometimes it starts before then, but the, the A1C is often falsely low once that EGFR is less than 30. And then they also recommend metformin and an SGLT2 inhibitor and adding a GLP-1 receptor if more treatment is needed or if one of these can't be tolerated. So this is a chart I'll, I'll let you have in the slide deck where you can say, okay, if my patient has a short life expectancy, their A1C should be higher. And if they have a long life, it should be lower. And depending on their hypoglycemic tendencies and awareness, et cetera, um, you can kind of decide where the A1C in your patients with diabetic kidney disease should be. Um, now, uh, the ADA guidelines also say to optimize blood pressure control to reduce the onset and progression of kidney disease. They emphasize not to discontinue the renin angiotensin system blockade for that mild increase in creatinine. And they emphasize that patients need enough protein but not excessive protein. When they're on dialysis, they need a higher intake because of the malnutrition risk. But they don't want them getting less than the 0.8 grams. So going down to a, a low protein diet won't benefit them. They just need to avoid the high protein diet. Um, and I'm running out of time, I'm so sorry. Uh, in, in patients who are not pregnant, they recommend ACE inhibitor or ARBs. Once the urine microalbumin is elevated, you need to monitor creatinine and potassium with diuretics, ACEs, and ARBs. But if the patient has a normal EGFR, no hypertension, no albuminuria, don't start them on an ACE inhibitor or an ARB unless they have hypertension, albuminuria, or a reduced EGFR. What is optimal blood pressure control? It depends if you're a cardiologist, a nephrologist, or a diabetologist. Cardiologists say less than 130 over 80. Nephrologists say under 140 over 90 if they have a normal EGFR and no albuminuria. Once they have albuminuria and a reduced EGFR, less than 130 over 80. Diabetologists say uh, that yes, that would be great, but patients with chronic kidney disease, patients with orthostatic hypotension, patients on lots of medications have a very high risk of adverse effects from high blood pressure control. And maybe in those patients are gonna be better off with a little bit higher goal. The adverse effects of uh, hypertensive medication, low blood pressure, fainting, acute kidney injury, like we already talked about, electric ab abnormalities. And the guidelines recommend checking for postural hypotension, orthostatic hypotension, on the first exam with the patient and intermittently after that. They also recommend not combining ACE and ARBs because it doesn't add any benefit, but it increases the risk of AKI and hyperkalemia. So 
Um, patients with an EGFR less than 30 should be referred to a nephrologist and they should be referred to a nephrologist if you're not sure about the etiology of kidney disease, if they have the secondary issues that are difficult or they have rapidly progressing uh, kidney disease. Um, the updates for 2022 are to continue even when the EGFR, SGLT2 inhibitors are 15 to 29. And there's these new mineral, uh, mineralocorticoid receptor agonist that the data is now showing protect the kidneys. And if they can't tolerate an SGLT2 inhibitor, those can be used. So because I'm running late, I'll answer the question for you. Um, it cannot be diagnosed on one abnormal urine albumin creatinine ratio. Progression can be slowed by appropriate treatment. It's most often associated with a slow decline. If they have a rapid decline, they need to be sent to a nephrologist and it increases the risk of cardiovascular disease. I have a lot of extra slides that I've put in here for you guys. Um, sorry that I ran over. I hope that answers some of your questions, Grace. Did it address them and, and help some of the rest of you? Um, it's kind of hard to get all the- I'm not sure I understand. Woo, Alexa. Um, uh, it's hard to get all the ADA standards in there in any kind of time. <laughs> I, I hope next month to do the eye, the eye disease, diabetes eye disease, ADA standards of care. But unfortunately, it's still about 27 slides, but uh, I may have to chop it in half. But I want to give people a uh, time to ask um, questions. Um, yeah, thank you so much for everybody joining us at this point. If you do have questions, please go ahead and unmute yourself or star six if you're on the phone. The, the question about the drinking water, uh, we've looked and looked for that because that's come up before. Can patients who don't drink a lot of water be prescribed an SGLT2 inhibitor? I would say they'd have more trouble with an ACE inhibitor than they will the SGLT2 inhibitor, 